Welcome to the Press Toward the Goal podcast. The Brisbane Lions are once again building to something special in the AFL. After winning their last premiership in 2003, that victory was of course part of a famous three-peat, an accomplishment matched by only one other side in the history of the competition. One man who played a key role in the Lions' golden era and was indeed awarded the Norm Smith Medal as best on ground in the 2001 Premiership joins me today. Sean Hart, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Jason. Good to be with you. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, We're going to obviously talk through your career and the impact your faith has had on your professional AFL career and life after that. But we'll just get started with a few quick questions, if you don't mind. No trouble, far away. Yeah, perfect. Uh, What did you want to be when you were growing up? I think I did want to be an AFL player, uh, an AFL footballer. Uh, watched my team, the Richmond Tigers, play, and uh, certainly that's that was the dream I had. I do tell people that I pro- it probably got superseded by the the desire to be a rock star, um, more so. Mm-hmm. But uh, but that, as people know me well and truly, um, no no real talent to sing, so that went by the wayside very quickly. Yeah, very good. Well, fulfilling one of those, I don't think's too bad. I don't think, and you certainly lived out many people's dreams. Yes, uh, it was certainly something to share with a lot of people. And uh, I like to say to people that when I was a young fella and, and watched Richmond play, that it was truly a pipe dream just to think that you could one day do that. Um, and then somehow uh, you find yourself uh, well past your, your wildest dreams, which is pretty cool. Yeah, fantastic. And you mentioned the Richmond Tigers there. Did you have a sporting hero as a child or during your youth? Yes, yeah, one of those players particularly. I like, I love them all, but uh, certainly uh, a, a player by the name of Dale Waitman who uh, went by the nickname The Flea. He was a um, uh, similar size to me probably and uh, he was the guy I think I admired the most as a, as a supporter of Richmond. Very good. Uh, you've got premiership medals and you've got a Norm Smith medal. Is there a piece of sports memorabilia or an item or something which you could never part with? Oh... Uh... No, not really. I don't think there's anything. Uh, I'll tell you what, one of my um, favourite bits of memorabilia, funny enough, just to add to the conversation, is a little uh, caricature piece that was done for the Norm Smith Medal, and uh, I use it in some of my presentations. I just like it. It's a, uh, it's again, it's a cartoon character picture of myself more than just the real stuff, and it's done, it's done by one of those fantastic cartoon artists, and uh, you know, it just reflects what you look like in in their eyes in a cartoon <laughs> form, and uh, it makes people laugh. So I. I probably cherish that one a little bit. I got on the on the shelf at home. It's a it's a good little piece. Yeah, very good, very good. So you, you've mentioned there AFL, obviously a big part of your life growing up. Um, you grew up in Shepparton in Victoria. Uh, what? How old were you when you started playing Australian rules football? I started over in a little town called Rochester. Actually, uh, they were the Tigers. Funny enough, as well in country Victoria, we lived in a small country town near there. Um, when I first started playing in the under eights over there and about seven years of age. And then by the time I was about 10 years of age, I, we would move to Shepparton into the Golden Valley football competition there. And, I'd, you know, again, I'd, I joined the under 13 com- uh, competition there at Shepparton United Footy Club. Uh, but my first game of football was at the Rochester Midgets, the under eights. Yeah, very good. And we, did you have a kind of natural talent from early on when you were playing? I... It's a good question. It's hard to remember. I imagine I had some level of um, talent. And I, I suppose the thing that I always had was a willingness to work hard, to listen to coaches, to just do uh, what the team needed me to do to to help it do its best. And, you know, probably I think I've always been someone that wanted to do what coaches and the team needed me to do to help us uh, yeah, perform well as a team. And that's probably how I built uh, my whole career, to be honest. I don't think I was highly talented as such. Uh, compared to some of the the guys who win the uh, win the sort of awards that you know that, that go over years and and uh, careers, but but I uh, certainly um, I think I think the the key to being part of successful teams is actually understanding how how you best serve that team. Yeah, very very good. Um, you obviously had some talent because you were taken in the nineteen eighty nine draft, a pick thirty three by the Brisbane Bears at that time. So just a young guy, what was that like? You know, you draft day or draft night, I'm not sure what it would have been back then, but you're moving quite a long way away from home. 
fair bit different, uh, definitely, Jason, to what it is currently, where it's televised and it's all exciting and it's a big gala event. I was actually on the way home from uh, the uh, Albury Wodonga area, where I was doing some study on the way back to Shepparton. To buy, you know, for the weekend, I'd always study up in there and then come back to my hometown of Shepparton. But I was on the way there and literally I was listening to a radio. I dropped a friend off um, at his little town, his hometown in Violet Town, a little tiny country town in Victoria again. And and I um, the radio came on at three o'clock in the afternoon, I think it was, and it announced that there was 15 players from the Goulburn Murray region had been drafted to different AFL clubs. So I'm listening on the radio to the draft, not on the TV and watching all this stuff going on at the moment. So, uh, and all of a sudden I got announced as, as being drafted by the Brisbane Bears. Well, that sent me into a state of shock, to be honest, because I would never anticipate I'd be moving into state to play footy. Um, and I hoped I'd obviously get drafted, but it was a bit of a shock at the time. I pulled the car over, I rang my parents and I said, oh, I think you guys better travel half an hour to come and meet me because I don't think I can keep driving. I'm, I'm a bit shaky. <laughs> so, uh, I was a bit emotional, a bit, uh, a bit shocked. So uh, it was an interesting time, uh, but... But uh, moving into moving into Queensland, it was just an incredible experience. And just to give you some really brief details of that, we moved up. Uh, the club was really struggling, of course, in terms of performance, a lot of older players yeah. and that. But I moved up into a house of 10 players. There was a housekeeper and 10 players up in a little suburb called Boonaroo Park on the Gold Coast. And, uh, and I moved up in the first uh, couple of weeks I was here. I started doing six or seven weeks on the road, on the roads of Queensland Roadworks before I'd head off to training in the afternoon. Wow. Such as the, the the timing and the the nature of football. I'd moved up on probably about a two and a half thousand dollar promise. That was about all it was um, as a base base payment for the year. And uh, and then you had to go and work and 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 earn your income outside of footy. Uh, but but living in a house full of ten players and one housekeeper was one heck of a uh, uh, an eye opening experience for the first part of your AFL career. Yeah, I can imagine it would have been a little bit rowdy in that house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you mentioned you mentioned there that the the Bears were struggling a little bit at the time, and I went through some records uh, last night, and hundred plus point defeats weren't totally uncommon in the late eighties, early nineties, and you made your debut around that period. What type of effect did that have on? the group, but more so on you personally. You're just coming into AFL, had dreams of being involved in this, and that's sort of what, what was happening week to week. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, certainly as a young player, you probably absorb it pretty well because you're just trying to make your way and you're happy to get a game. And you know, and then as the years go on and you continue to not have success, uh, it, becomes, it becomes a bit challenging. But it, it, was, it was an interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, it was an interesting uh, journey, no doubt. I look back on my career, if I could just snapshot it a little bit, I look back and I think about the time before Lee Matthews, I really didn't consider myself to be uh, an AFL quality player. And we were playing in a you know, team that, again, as you said, was struggling to win and perform up until about 1995 at the end of Robert Walls' reign when he'd announced he was leaving. Then all of a sudden we started to win. We won about six out of the last seven games, made our first finals in 1995. It just came out of nowhere that season um, and all of a sudden, and then we merged with the Fitzroy Lions, became the Brisbane Lions. All of a sudden things started happening. We had a little bit of growth and success, but not the ultimate. Um, and then we then we nosedived again, you know. So, uh, so I, I look back and I reflect and I think a lot of my career, I felt like I wasn't really in hindsight AFL level player. And, and yet then when Lee came along and, and really taught us the, the reality of how to play the game properly, individually and collectively, all of a sudden you felt like you actually belonged. You felt like you you des deserved to be on the AFL field and performing at that level. And all of a sudden with uh, great recruiting, um, you know, the, the my last probably from 99 to 2004, my final year, really felt like um, I was part of the AFL and a, and, a, and a successful part of a team that was challenging for premiership. Yeah, it's really interesting you, you say that about not feeling like you belong there. Was it? Did you almost take it personally, like the personal responsibility for some of the results that the team was was facing? Oh, I think you, I think you do start to do that. Um, and there's a couple of things that can happen. You can certainly personally get down and a bit depressed about it, and struggle to work out whether or not there's a um, there's sometimes a future for you at the club, or whether the future of the club's positive as well uh, in terms of s success. But I think the um, uh, the other thing uh, is that you, um, you know, looking back anyway, the the understanding of just persevering, you know, the reality of perseverance and how important it is. Um, and 
and understanding that while you might have the worst game of your life, next week can be totally different. Um, and, uh, you know, tomorrow can be a really totally different day to a bad day today. So the um, the, the reality um, for me on the Gold Coast, once I'd moved in and settled in on the Gold Coast, despite the footy results, was, was life was really good on the Gold Coast. Um, I, still, I still had a challenge not um, seeing my identity and purpose beyond footy. That was a real problem because I was very much trying to build my identity on performance. Um, and that's uh, something I know now to be a very dangerous thing, a very um, uh, shaky ground um, for any of us to try and build our, our identity and purpose on. Um, and so in amongst all of that, um, in amongst the, the, the roller coaster and the battles, the ups and downs of AFL football, um, we yes, we were poor for a while, but but we we always saw the light that we were improving. We were starting to get some young players into the club because we did come from a club that was just put together from a whole lot of players to then be a club where where recruiters really and, and sound recruiters like Scott Clayton put together a list where we with the right coach we could we could do some special things. Yeah, and you mentioned your identity there. Um, I believe there was a almost a turning point for you in 1992 where um, that may not have been as much your uh, identity being based in your performance and found in that aspect of your life? Yeah, there's definitely some pivotal times in the early 90s. Um, I uh, was at a spot, I suppose, in 1992. Was, uh, sorry, 1991. It was actually my second year of footy and I started a journey. I was really struggling. I'd had a really good year, first year, a lot of opportunities in a poor club to, to play. I was athletically um, uh, sound in terms of uh, ready to play AFL footy. It's just probably with older guys there, the, the door opened earlier than what it would have done at other clubs. And But in the second year of my career, really, it really felt like I went backwards. And funny enough, I found out years later that um, I was in amongst three players who were uh, considered to not have any more career left after that year, my second year. And fortunately, I was one, the one of three, because uh, they're only picking one of those three to continue on. I was the one that was selected to get an extra opportunity. As I said, I didn't know about that. Uh, it wow. just happened that it was told to me years later by Robert Walls, our coach at that time. And uh, so, so you know, sometimes you can be really close as well to to the end of it. But I, uh, in, in, in all of that and in describing like I did the reality that football had become everything for me. It was all about, you know, I didn't have any other purpose, didn't have any other identity, didn't have anything else that I was pursuing in life. And and yet the reality was it could have almost finished after two years. And, and even with a long career, it still um, it was holding a position like that that was just not sustainable. And uh, and performance can never sustain us. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's part true. of what we do. Um, achievement and, and performance is part of what we seek, but it can never give us identity truly. It can never give us purpose truly. It can never give us... Our, our our worth truly um, and so I was really searching um, and at that time I met the lady who's now my wife Linda and uh, she was a uh, Christian lady and uh, I recognised the difference in her life compared to my life and uh, fell in love with her and uh, and and it was in it was in connecting with her and in understanding uh, that was something missing in life, my life that I I went on a search really for for the meaning and purpose of my life beyond this performance-based identity, beyond sport, beyond football and being a rich and famous footballer. And um, in 1992, I happened to go along to church with her uh, on the Gold Coast. And uh, interestingly, I heard a testimony of a, a European lion tamer. His name is Kay Shrug. And he spoke incredible stuff of what he did, obviously, uh, big lions and putting his head in their mouths and working with orcas and all sorts of stuff. And and he made a statement. I was in amongst about 300 people with Linda, my wife, at the church to stay and and he said, you know what, you could be a footballer with all the fame and fortune you ever wanted. Wow. But in the end, what would it be worth if you sold your soul? He was relating it to Mark, Mark 8.36 in, in the Bible and, and and in another one or two spots as well. The uh, the reality for me was that that just struck me. It just struck me in the heart big time. And, and yeah. I thought that's 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 exactly what you're speaking to me ultimately about my life at the moment, my search at the moment. Um, and it was that day that I, I made a decision that I uh, would follow Jesus Christ, that I would believe in uh, that Jesus was the truth and I would, I would follow him and, um, and, and live my life uh, following him and, and, and for him. And I, uh, uh, along the journey from there, I'll talk about it a bit more, but I, along the journey from there, real, I realised the reality of faith and I've come to know that reality of faith over the roller coaster from then. Um, 
but I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit in a, you know, probably as we go forward. But I, but the, but the early uh, reality of my coming to faith in Jesus Christ was that there was no freedom I'd ever experienced like knowing the truth of uh, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the reality of of uh, uh, who Christ is and what He's done for each of us. Yeah, that's that's brilliant, and maybe a little bit ironic that it was a lion tamer that tamed the lion. Very, very ironic, and I, I know people chuckle when I share that often because it is a uh, it's a really interesting little uh, uh, thought that uh, that taming taming is an interesting thing. Even like uh, he was a lion tamer, but I was probably a my taming was needing to be needing to discover who I was and a purpose yeah. beyond beyond performance, beyond what I do. You know, as I said, it's a dangerous thing to think that I'm going to discover who I am in what I do. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And um, you went into, obviously, the football environment, AFL, quite a hard, tough game. Traditionally masculine, egotistical kind of football environment. How was your faith perceived and how was that received by your teammates? I think the, uh, the overall statement I'd make about that, Jason, is that the reality of how we live out our faith is the greatest influence. It's, you know... Uh, that old saying that um, you know, preach preach the gospel, we'll use words if necessary. You know, the reality is that that actions speak so much power, more powerfully than words. And so I think the the overriding thing that I understood by you know, throughout my career and by the end of my career was that uh, the impact and influence I had on people um, could not really be measured except for uh, the reality of the responses they would give me or the or the relationships that that I, I would have along the way, and and you know you you walk through this life, and you you wonder about you know what your purpose and what your impact is. Um, but I think that what we what we've got to understand is as we walk strongly in faith and 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 follow what we believe to be the truth um, and and live that out, um, it becomes real for other people. They might not even say it to you, but it impacts them and it influences them, and and ultimately it leads them to a decision as well where that I found myself at where I've got to decide whether or not um, I believe and what I believe and um, and whether or not um, that will be uh, what I'll set my whole life's purpose on because um, you know ultimately I think we're, we're either gonna we're either going to be found by Jesus Christ or we're going to remain lost that's that's what I think I've discovered about life and uh, and we can we can seek Funny enough, we can seek identity. We can seek all sorts of things in in everything in the world. There's so many things we can try to find our identity in, or try to escape into and hide into. Um, and I've tried that as well. Don't worry about that. But the uh, the reality is, um, I really really believe we can only truly find our identity uh, in in God, in and that is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's so good. Uh, how did how did your newfound faith affect the way that you approach the game? Because it's obviously, like we mentioned, an aggressive kind of, uh, quite a masculine kind of arena, the football field. Did you have any difficulty reconciling that with the, who you wanted to be off the field? Yeah, it's a great question. Again, I, I, I don't think so. I think I've got probably a great uh, lesson just by uh, a challenging statement that was made. And I'll tell a story a little bit that, I think this really helped me understand that as as a follower of Christ, I'm fighting. I'm fighting the good fight of faith. I'm actually fighting for the souls of men and women ultimately. And uh, uh, but in in terms of on the football field and in footy terms, I think I I was probably one of those guys who played um, well within the fair boundaries, if you know what I mean, compared to those who try to stretch the rules all the way. And uh, but I what I what I found out in 1990. Um, 1998, actually. Uh, sorry, let me just think. No, it was not. That's right. It's 2001, actually. On the journey in 2001, I'm just getting my years right. I found out um, something that was really significant for me, and uh, in terms of what you asked there, and that was that in 2001 we got to a place. Yeah, it was our first premiership year. We got to a place where we were four wins and five losses, and our old coach, again, I've referred to him a couple of times, Robert Walls made a statement, he was writing for the Age newspaper at that stage, and he made a statement in the article that the Lions will never win a premiership because they have too many Mr Nice Guys. And so he mentioned seven players in that article. I was one of them. And wow. it, it grated on me because it was my 12th year of AFL football, and I thought, wow, this is interesting. He's basically saying that because of the way I go about footy and six other players particularly, 
that we won't be a team that can actually survive the pressure and compete hard enough to you know to take to take the ultimate prize in football. And so so it really it really made me think and really uh, ch- you know, challenged me to to work out whether there was some truth in it. And uh, you know sometimes we can just dismiss it and say oh, I don't believe it, rubbish, do nothing about it. But but I found myself saying you know what there's something right about this and there's something. Um, interesting about actually how I might respond to this and, and and not to prove it wrong, but actually say, you know what, I think it's correct. And maybe there's a way that I need to go about fighting fighting the good fight of faith, fighting you know for my teammates, fighting for success more. And it, it turned into this simple simple action that I realised that out on the footy field, um, there was uh, another level of competitiveness in terms of my um, competitive aggression, and that's not to say that aggression, uh, you know, violence or anything like that, but it's actually just the ability to compete to, um, as we used to say, to take take space off people, to, to stop, to limit the opposition, to, to do all the sorts of things that a lot of my teammates would do, but, but being a Mr Nice guy, I probably would just play the game and, and not be so brutally um, aggressive in terms of trying to make sure I limit the ability of opponents and, and, to, and um, opposition players to... To uh, to get to get to certain places on the ground and you know bump into them, do whatever I needed to. Again, it wasn't a verbalising, but I found myself just physically uh, working uh, harder against the opposition to stop them from getting what they wanted and doing what they wanted to do. And that was a simple little change that I made to go from being a Mr. Nice guy to being someone who was more competitive. Funny enough, um, you know, uh, literally within a week, we started on a 16-game winning streak. Now, that wasn't just because I changed my aggressiveness you know, towards the opposition necessarily, but I think it stung us into action. I think on the back of understanding um, how we how we need to play roles within a team better and actually committing to that. I think there was something for me that really spoke to me about just how uh, how much um, I was fighting for something and how much I could do to uh, to to build my um, impact in the team and my influence on the team just by doing some simple things that most other players were doing that I was actually by my nature, by my character, by my personality, wasn't choosing to do. And so that was a little, little story of um, just how I changed my way. Um, you know, and I, I don't think it was less, less Christian, let's say. I think it was actually more because I think it was more of a decision to actually apply yourself to, um, to all three dimensions, with all three dimensions of your being to the, to the contest that you're a part of. Yeah, that's it's really interesting. There, we we all face challenges. We all face criticism or people kind of casting their opinion about us in different areas of life. And the value there, which you've shared in confronting that and not dismissing that, is really really speaking to me about you know how powerful it is to be able to process that and take that on board and mm. try and grow from that rather than being offended or being hurt by something that other people may say. Yes, yeah, big, big time, big time. I think, uh, yeah, I think it was a, it was a great growth period for me. Um, and I, I think the reality is that, um, you know, we we are in a fight um, in this life. We're in a fight, and um, it, it's um, it, we'd like to probably have it all comfortable all the time, but but it's the, often often the times that we we dig in and we find some new level of effort and some new level of commitment, some new level of. Um, reality of covenant actually of actually uh, you know uh, the promises we make and following through on those that ultimately we 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 reach a new level of relationship or a new level of uh, influence um and um and performance again um and again that's probably the other thing about performance i think when we get our identity and our purpose right then we we thoroughly believe um the group of people i work with at an entity called id sports we thoroughly believe that performance flows from that uh, you know the personal best results flow from um, understanding truly who we are and understanding the, the right purpose for our lives. Yeah. And uh, part, being part of a team as well, there's probably some parallels there about looking not just for yourself and competing, uh, uh, playing sport for yourself. It's obviously a team game, but not just being kind of internally driven. It's more being part of the bigger team looking for other people and seeing how you can impact them and even make their dreams come true for them, help them be the best that they can be as well. That's so true, Jason, so true. It's taught me a lot for life, to be honest. The the amount of, just how simple it is, the amount of opportunities we get to impact other people every day even, and just how simple it can be through just a word of encouragement, um, or you know, a whole lot of whole lot of different ways. We, um, you know, like like in a footy team, 
there's there's constant opportunities to actually get outside yourself and to see what um you know, see what God's created you for to 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 influence the people around you. So yeah, and, and the ability to use and again you've you've been given certain talents. I know mine in football was running and and um and just being able to uh, be resilient under fatigue. Um so to be able to give that to the team, to be able to give that to teammates, to be able to you know, understand the teammates who needed the ball in their hands so that I could do the team stuff to help them get that ball in their hands. You know, the, the reality of what we can do uh, to serve others um, is endless, really. Yeah, and you, that led that kind of attitude that, that you had on the field uh, led to Lee Matthews saying that you were the most selfless player that um, he'd ever known in the AFL. So certainly you lived that out. It's not just something that you're saying, something that you lived out as well. Yeah, again, that's another reflection, I was, as I talked about earlier, of just what people think without necessarily saying it. Now, Lee said that towards the end of my career. I, um, um, it's probably one of the highlights, really, of that whole journey, that that, that would be something that I'd be, um, or the, a way I'd be thought of, because you don't, again, you don't necessarily realise it. You commit yourself to to being a team player, um, and to hear that from Lee was um, was incredibly uh important to, to understand the, the journey that you, you'd been on and the influence that you'd had and the way that that people had perceived what you'd done so that so that they knew that you were committed more to the big picture than, than to your own picture so yeah I, um, I I really cherish those those comments and um and uh, and the time that Lee or the investment really that Lee put into me to help me probably not just in footy but beyond that into my life well beyond footy yeah, but you touched on earlier uh, going into round 10 of the 2001 season, Lions had a four-win, five-loss record, so they were yes. negative win-loss record at that stage. Coming up against defending Premiers Essendon, they were top of the table at the time. You did the job on them and then ironically came around to beat them again in the 2001 grand final. Was How do you look back on that sort of period? Um, I think I think you look back and you sort of yeah uh, you, you're amazed at just how quickly it can change, uh, but I think I think the reality the building blocks were there. It was just a matter of the message uh, being received and understood and activated and and working out just what it looked like. I suppose a little bit. I think that's the key. You know, you can have a whole lot of words and uh, values and all sorts in in an organisation or in in your own family, whatever it might be, but. But it's the practical application. What what does that look like? I think is a great question you ask always um, to make sure that you know the behaviours uh, that that relate to those words and and what it will look like to see that we're doing such and such a thing. And I, but I think the 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 little story behind that again, um, some people might have heard it, might not. But the little story to me is is all about understanding the value of knowing what you what role you need to play for the team and being committed to play that role um, to serve the team. Um, and not to use it for your own gain, or not to not to do, you know, not to just play the game for yourself, sort of thing. And I think so. I think it's that little that little shift because I think you can be doing it at a level, but again, it's a matter of whether you're not you're prepared to take the hundred percent, turn the dial up to hundred percent of my focus is to play my role for the team. And so, what we did around that time, interesting, Jason, is the the story goes that that week in leading into round ten, where we we came up against the invincible team who'd only lost one game in two years, literally. Uh, we had to have a, a bit of a plan, and Lee was always very, um, very astute in bringing a, a theme to to a game. And and that week, he watched the the movie Predator, and in that movie, there's a a hunt for a, what was an invincible creature. It seemed like, and and yet this team was able to take it down. And 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 Lee came into our uh, team meeting early in the week that week, and he just said, you know, watch this movie, and this is what I took out of it that. Um, that there was a team that understood the roles that each of them played and by them, um, you know, applying those roles and that. And he said there were three things they did. They they uh, they knew their role, um, they accepted their role, and they then performed their role ultimately. And and the key part probably for me became the acceptance of it. Do you really accept that I've got to do yeah. these things for the team time and time again to make sure that uh, that we get the best result? Anyway, we went out that game. As you said, we won with about 26 points that day. Uh, not that I remember the detail of it, but uh, the, um, <laughs> the uh, reality was from there we 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 gained the confidence of, from that that theme, and and we created a we created an award that week called the Role Appreciation Award as well, which 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 coupled with that became something that players would vote for other players about who played their role the best for the team. That became a significant motivator 
of players and um, because it was given to players sometimes who barely had a kick, barely got a goal, but did their role, certain things might have been the most spoils as a as a backman or whatever it might have been, something that stood out for them in um, in helping us win um, and it was voted on by each player towards another player. Um, that became really significant and and led us to 16 wins in a row. So it was, it was just a shift in mindset and valuing of the right things, I think. That was probably what, what transformed our team, Jason. Yeah, that's fantastic. And you mentioned the 16 consecutive wins, which culminated with the grand final victory over Essendon. Uh, you collected the Norm Smith medal that, that day and famously in your speech you acknowledged Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. Now, was that something which was kind of pre-planned or was it just just where your heart was and the first thing that come to mind to kind of celebrate that success? Well, it definitely probably wasn't pre-planned. I was, uh, I was second <laughs> last on the betting second last on the betting line, to be honest. Uh, wow. I found, I found that out because I was when I was running around the MCG after that, some bloke yelled out to me, he said, oh, thanks very much. I've just won $2,400 because you were 60 to 1 and I'll put 40 bucks on you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, clearly I was not not anywhere in the reckoning for that. But um, but again, it, it is, is, is a little bit of a story if I could just spend the next 60 seconds trying of to course. Uh, spit a story out behind that. Seven years before that, I had the darkest time in my life. I was in a depression, didn't want to get out of bed, tucked away. It was 1994, you know, a couple of years into deciding to follow Jesus, I had the, uh, the the biggest faith challenge to that time in my in my career. And I didn't I didn't pass it. I, I failed it to be honest. I failed the ability to actually trust God and to um and to uh, walk in faith uh, through a, a time that was very challenging. And I found myself in a really dark place. And it was only through the love of my wife and uh, and uh, our footy club chaplain that I was able to walk out of that to be honest. And obviously the grace of God as well that I was able to walk out of that. And uh, into uh, into health again, and and to continue on, I was desperate to give up, to be honest. But uh, you know, I, I talk about that story because I recognise that seven years later, when uh, and and sorry, the the key part of that that period in in 1994 was a was a real fear of of loss of this you know this identity and purpose of football that I was seeking, real fear of loss of that, and a real just fear of um, you know, uh, judgment of performance and all those things that really just rattled my cage. And I, I as I said, I slipped into a place of depression at that time. And and yet, um, you know, seven years later, uh, by the grace of God, I found myself in my 12th year, you know, coming to grand final day to uh, to play after we beat Richmond, uh, my old team in the prelim final uh, at the Gabba. But on the way home from uh, that, that game, I had this enormous wave of fear once again just sweep over me. It was just a fear of personal and team failure and, um, and, it, it was only through that lesson seven years ago and the lessons on the journey up to that stage that I realised that there's only one way to face fear and it's to look it straight in the eye and um, and speak the word of God to it. And um, and so I, uh, in, in, in that moment, driving home from that game, that preliminary final, I decided that I had to build the week on a scripture and I, I chose um, and was led to Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I knew Brilliant. that with that scripture um, in my heart that um, no matter what happened on grand final day, that, that, that God would, would be with me and he'd strengthen me. Uh, and sure enough, you know, I uh, went from a place of incredible fear um, early in that week, a ridiculous time to be fearing you know, playing in your first grand final, but to a place of probably feeling the strongest I've ever felt when I ran out onto a football field in the AFL. And, um, and the performance that flowed from that clearly was, was one of my better ones, uh, but I. Um, but again, it was it was from a place. I, I tell the story because it's from a place in 1994, a very dark, very dark place, to then a place of fear a week out from the grand final to to a place of real peace, real strength, and um, and and again uh, high performance once the once the ball was bounced. So I love telling that story because it, it's a it's for me it's the the roller coaster of life and the reality of the dark times. But if if uh, if by the grace of God um, we can find who we are truly in Christ, then um, I think we can always walk through the valley and uh, and find ourselves potentially on the mountain. Yeah, it's a great testimony and really interesting for me that you mentioned fear of failure when you've won 15 matches in a row. You've made the way to the grand final, first time in Brisbane AFL club's history, and you're still confronted by that emotion or that thought of failing 
Yeah, yeah, well said. Well said. Fifteen in a row, you'd reckon there'd be there'd be all sorts of confidence, but again, it just becomes that reality um, of the the prize that's at the end of it. But again, it's the reality also. I I say of the world system. You know, we're so programmed if we're not careful in the world to to chase after things, to find our identity in them, and find our security in them. And you know, and so all of a sudden you've got a grand final, and you're thinking about the what it means to win it and what it means to lose it. And you go, well, you know, I, I'm not sure if I want to face the reality of the the negative part of that, but everyone has to face it, of course. But the but the fear that comes in and 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 you know the reality of that fear is that it, it comes in to to steal, kill, and destroy, and yeah. um, and that's that's all it comes into. And so many people face fear, anxiety. You know, anxiety is just out of control in our world. But Absolutely. a lot of it's to do with with uh, trusting the world system instead of trusting God. Ultimately, that's that's what I discovered. You know, we can put our try to put our trust in a whole lot of things in this world, possessions and profile and social media and whatever it might be. But ultimately, it's just empty, absolutely empty, and lead, leads to nothing. Um, but but faith in Jesus will always sustain us, and in you know, in this life and and in the life to come. Yeah, that's so good. Um, you mentioned there that your identity, obviously, in Jesus, but that that playing group that was there, I had a look last night. There were five players in that group who have gone on to be senior coaches at AFL clubs and also another three or four who have been highly kind of up in the coaching ranks in senior leadership roles within the club, uh, sorry, within various AFL clubs. Um, the leadership group that was there at that time, was that something do you think that was kind of fostered by Lee Matthews or was it something which kind of everyone had internally and they developed it themselves? It kind of just come together at the time? No, I think it was very much fostered by Lee. He's got to, he's got to take some credit for that. The, the, the guys that have gone on to coach and, you know, um, Michael Voss and, and particularly even Craig McRae currently, you know, um, you know, you got the Scott brothers and, and um, other, other guys, you know, Justin Lepage, different guys. Just trying to think of them all. Actually, there's a lot of them, like you said. But the yeah. um, the reality is that they were always you know, incredible leaders in their own right, um, and uh, you know both by uh, the inspiration they would give, but also the challenge that they would give to for players to you know to, to rise up and to and to give to the team what they needed to give. And so they were always um, that type of player. But I think it was Lee. I seriously, do think it was Lee being able to actually uh, help each of those players, um, all of us players, understand just what great team football was built on and, you know, what, what great team was built on um, ultimately. And, and again, those lessons are not just footy lessons, they're lessons for life and, and lessons of how we, how we do community and, you know, how we, what we, what we really need to focus on and not focus on. So I think those players were, were always you know, destined to, to be leaders, but without Lee's uh, leadership for us through that period and helping us to get to the top of the mountain three times and, and almost four, uh, you, you wonder whether or not the, the careers they've had as coaches would have been the same. Yeah, that's right. Um, I, d I do like to um, get some listener questions in. I think there's a good segue there. Uh, you mentioned almost four grand final successes. I've got a question here from a listener, B Hacks, on Instagram. And he asks, obviously, 2004, you suffered what was ultimately a career-ending injury in the preliminary final, fractured both cheekbones, quite a sickening collision with a teammate. He asked, what was it like after three grand final victories, watching the fourth one and being helpless to do anything uh, from a hospital bed? Oh, yeah, it was, again, you realise you just wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to be out there ultimately. Um, I've got a great picture of my puffed-up face um, that I like to show and make people laugh, but... Uh, the reality was I just couldn't be out there. It opened the door for I think it was Ashley McGrath to play in that grand final, so someone else to play. It was always it was always going to be hard to watch uh, that grand final, you know, when you couldn't contribute. But but you know it's out of your hands, and you you just trust that that the boys can uh, can get it done. They they couldn't that day. Port had probably been you know ready to to win for three or four years, and we, they just stopped. They sorry they lost their opportunity through losing early finals. So we we. Uh, pounced on that each time and and went all the way, but uh, yeah, it was just it was difficult. But but again, you you realise that you can't do much. So instead of getting caught up in what you can't do, you probably just got to let it let it happen. That's what you realise. Yeah, and that obviously was your final game. You retired, and retirement something which a lot of people struggle with. 
you know, losing their identity, being a footballer. But from our conversation, I gather that that may not have had as great an impact on yourself as it may on some other players. Yeah, definitely. Uh, still, there's still a, an impact that every person has, I believe, uh, no matter what it is, um, particularly to do with your work and, and identity being in your work. Uh, but I, um, but certainly the transition was a whole lot easier than what I know some AFL players have. Yeah. Got a question here from um, Raphael Stoneham. I think that we have somewhat covered this, but he asks, when things are going well, public support and opinion is with you. How do you deal with the reverse situation people are calling for the heads of people in the organisation, players, coaches, and that sort of thing? Yeah, again, that's a great, that's a great question. It's a, it's a good learning curve, really. Um, whether you're young, you're going to find that there's – the easy thing to do is to um, agree with media or just to, you know, to look for who to blame and point the finger and, and you know, all sorts of stuff. But – but ultimately what you learn is there's not much value in that. In fact, it, 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 it creates disunity and it's really destructive. So I think over the journey, you learn that actually uh, you, you need to stand up for people and recognise um, and support them. Um, and, and ultimately things happen that need to happen within organisations and people make calls and that. But, but I think the best thing, the best thing um, to do always is to actually uh, make sure that you're not the one who's, you know, uh, accusing people of of not you know, of being responsible for what's happening, but actually being able to take your own personal responsibility within the situation and um, and and work with the people in there that as well as you possibly can to actually rectify it, um, persevere through what you need to, and and just get you know, get the truth out on the table and that. And I, yeah, that's probably what I've learned over the journey. It's easy easy uh, as a young person to just sort of think to, to look to who else to blame because. You know, we need someone else to blame, but but the more experience you get, the the more you realise it's so important that you pull together with people and uh, you do your best to solve the problems um, and not make them bigger. Yeah, very good. Uh, Jason Ferner, now he's a mad Bombers fan, and he said that you broke his heart in two thousand and one, uh, but he did still want to ask you uh, what was the hardest factor going into a new season after winning the premiership. And what was the biggest motivation to keep you competing at that level? Yeah, that's really, really, really good. I um, I like that question. I just wanted to throw something in there, given it was at that time. You did ask the question about the Norm Smith Medal and that speech and that. So in yep. talking about that story, that's what led me. That's what led me ultimately to to speak and to and to, and to proclaim uh, my 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 gratefulness to my Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ because of that journey from 1994 all the way through. But the reality. Um, from there was that all of a sudden you're a, you're a premiership player, you're a Norsworth medalist, um, and you've got a great period there to live in that until all of a sudden the season comes around again. Uh, but again, it was the genius of Lee Matthews uh, to answer the question that you've just given me and, uh, and the reality of the character of our group, I think, to respond to that. Uh, what I mean by that is that um, the greatest challenge, I think, in backing up is actually players' motivation to continue to do the things they've done, you know, and understand and recognise yeah. those things and to go on prepared to do those things again. So when we got back into the pre-season of 2002, uh, Lee um, did something really um, uh, different. And what he did was he put up the last two minutes of the grand final. So he first meeting back, he put up the last two minutes of the grand final. That was still just holding the ball up in the air. Um, you know, Siren goes, we're celebrating. Um, and so the lights are out. It's all very romantic. And then all of a sudden he says, right, switch the lights on um, and turn that off. And he says, and he rolls down his big whiteboards. He, has, he had it set up beautifully. And he goes, um, and he had two words on the board. And he said, and they were hungry, actions. And he said, right, that's done right now. That's done. It's finished. It's long gone. Um, now I want to know what are the things you're going to do in this preseason, the hot summer of Queensland, to show that you're hungry to go back to the top of the mountain again, ultimately. And that's what he did. And so we, in the first meeting, were, were led to make a statement about the things that we'd tracked through our pre-season to see whether or not we uh, we were keeping our commitment to the things we were going to do to, to uh, attempt to go back to the top of the mountain again. So that was literally uh, the way that we initially got motivated by Lee. And I think, again, the character of the group from there was to actually live up to that, the leadership, the bosses, the leppages, you know, the McCrae's, the... The Scots, all of the Lappins, uh, the uh, were all, you know, committed. Lynch committed to the the journey to do those things and keep each other accountable to those things, and that's what helped us, I think, go back to back. And clearly, there's a there's a 
a thirst and a hunger you get from winning them. You want to go there again. But but I think the greatest challenge is actually motivating people to go again to, yeah. and to actually do what they need to do. Um, and that's what our group and particularly our coaches were, were able to do with our group um, in the two seasons to follow and almost three. Yeah, perfect. I'd like to finish every podcast with, with the same question we ask all the guests. You're a triple premiership winner, Norm Smith medalist. But how does Sean Hart want to be remembered? Well, um, it's, a, it's a great song. It's a great song um, by, uh, I'm trying to think, it was, it was by Counting, Counting Crows, whatever. Um, and no, it's something by um, Casting, Casting Crowns, sorry, Casting Crowns. And it talks about how um, I don't really care about whether I'm remembered, but uh, it's ultimately about the name of Jesus. Um, so that's that's the reality uh, for me that... Um, they, they do a couple of songs, actually, you know, Nobody But Jesus and um, Only Jesus. And I think it's Only Jesus where that talks about, it doesn't matter about who I am ultimately, it matters about um, people knowing Jesus um, and uh, finding their identity in Jesus Christ. And so uh, if my life uh, reflects that and, and helps helps people to, uh, to know what I've been blessed to know and had my eyes open to and my heart, open to then um then that's that'll be enough for, for me to know that i've lived on purpose i think uh for for the purpose that i've been created for um that that would be the thing i think that would be the best mark you know, the best marker at, at my funeral that's for sure yeah haven't spoken to you for for the period that we have this morning i'm not at all surprised that that's that's the response that you give for that question no worries. Well, um, I think uh, yeah, there's there's a whole lot of things I could say to that, but I um, but yeah, it's just it's very humbling to uh, to know in life that you know there's there's so much you can so much you can have and get and and that, but ultimately you know that when you when you live a when you live in gratitude and you live to give, I think yeah, it's just the quality of life is just so much better. Um, and you know ultimately, you know it's it's the world again the world system. <clears throat> let me finish with this, mate. The world system again is so deceptive it, it can make you feel a million bucks or it can make you feel like you're worth zero to be honest and um and and you can pursue all sorts of things within the world system uh to try to find out who you are and to, and to and to get what you can for yourself and you can live your whole life like that to be honest and uh and i, I just don't know i just don't know uh why uh, people continue to do that because for me it's, a, it's an empty pursuit again it feels like it feels like they're constantly getting temporary filled but but there's so much more to actually finding your your true identity and your true purpose, um, and it, and it, and it can never truly be found in the world system. Yeah, that's fantastic, Sean. I've had a great great time speaking with you this morning. Really appreciate you coming on the Press Toward the Goal podcast. No trouble, Jason. Thanks for having me on. Thank you.